Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Jason Harlow. I'm here to welcome uh, Ruth Shabai and uh, Bruce Sherwood uh, to give our colloquium today. Uh, Ruth Shabai is a professor emerita of physics at NCS North Carolina State University. She has a BS in chemistry from the University of Chicago and a PhD in physical chemistry from the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Urbana she has taught at the University of Illinois in um, also Stanford, CMU, NCSU, High Point University, and the University of North Texas. She is a fellow of APS and APT. Bruce Sherwood is a professor emeritus in physics, also NCSU. He has a BS in engineering science from Purdue University and a PhD in experimental particle physics from uh, University of Chicago. He has taught at Caltech, uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, CMU, and NCSU. He's a fellow of APS, a a APT, and AAAS. Shabai and Sherwood are co-authors of the calculus-based uh, introductory physics textbook, Matter and Interactions, and developers of uh, vPython. So I don't know which one of you is. <laughs> so Sherwood will go first. Thank you. Don't forget the. This goes where? I guess it goes on. That's me. Oh, oh, that's right. <laughs> okay. So, this is a tag team that is divided into two pieces. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about what is vPython and how does it work and how you would make the vPython program and why you might want to. Um, and then Ruth is going to talk about how this plays out as a tool in the freshman calculus-based physics course. And we started working on this in 1997, when Ruth pointed out that we couldn't really be teaching authentic physics in the intro physics course if it didn't include computation. And so we start trying to do that. There are challenges to doing that, though, because what are you going to leave out? And uh, the students don't know anything about programming and, and all that, which means that the programming environment has to be unusually easy to use, easy to learn, easy to use. And that's what the Python is about. And so we're going to show you how it works. And I, I will show you how it works. And Ruth will show you what you do with it in education. And so... Let me start by saying, if you go to webvpython.org, you see this presentation, uh, I'm going to sign into this place. And having signed in, I can look at my programs that are stored in the cloud. And I'm going to take a, an empty program that just starts out we're going to write a web view Python program. By web, we mean this is a Python code running in the browser, which is not a possibility because Python doesn't run in browsers. But there's a thing called Rapid Script, which can, in your browser, transpile your, your Python code to JavaScript, which can run in the browser. And let's see, you are seeing that. OK. Uh, should I make it a little larger or not? Yeah, okay. Um, good enough? Okay. That's too big. So I'm going to write a 3D pro a program that generates a 3D image. This is very difficult, typically. It requires a very large amount of very arcane code. But let's just try, nevertheless, um, the world's shortest attempt at a 3D program. And if I run that program, huh, I actually get, I have to zoom out a little bit, I actually got a navigable 3D box, which is by default one by one by one, and which by default has some lights up and to the le uh, left and right, and uh, has positioned the camera so that this box fills the canvas that we're looking at. And that means that the first thing to know about vPython is it has a very large number of well thought out defaults. So if you say box, why should you also have to say 
light it up so I can see it. If you see a box, why shouldn't there actually be a box? And why shouldn't there, in fact, be mouth interactions, uh, mouse interactions there to let me do things like rotate and zoom and also um, pan? Why not? Makes sense. Now, it doesn't mean that you're locked into this. You can certainly make some modifications. So let's, let's, let's modify this. That was the default. Well, the default color is white. Let's, from the color palette, choose instead orange. And uh, let's also make the length, meaning in the X direction, X to the right, Y up, Z out towards you, right-handed coordinate system. Um, and so what I was gonna do was make a length that's three and see what that gives us. Well, having made a typo, it tells me I got an E in there, which I, I was a silent E. Um, and lo and behold, it's orange. The, the length was misspelled. See, I'm showing you that it's a real programming language. <laughs> and, and sure enough, it's a lot longer now, okay? So this is the first thing I reiterate. You can do simple things very simply. You can do somewhat more complicated things with a little bit more effort. You can do really quite extraordinary things if you work at it more. But in the intro course, you need to start small. And this lets you do that. And, and we'll get beyond this very soon. So for my second trick, I'm going to show you a program running that's more complex. Here's a binary star system. Um, you've got two elliptical orbits. Uh, they're leaving trails as these stars move around. Um, I still have the ability to, to see whether, in fact, they lie in a plane, and sure enough, they do, uh, and, and so on. Um, and having shown you this, I'm going to show you the code for it. And the first thing to see is it's very short. It's very short. And I'm going to make it bigger to be able to read the individual pieces. And I'm going to show you the things one step at a time. Oh, let's see, I don't need this here. I don't think, do I? Um, so first we just define Newton's gravitational constant. We call it capital G, because that's what it's usually called. Um, we'll create a giant star, we'll name it giant. We'll make a sphere. The sphere has a position. We're going to position it at a vector location minus one times 10 to the 11th is zero, zero. That's sort of like distance to, from here to the sun, actually. And so here's another new thing. vPython supports vectors as objects. And there are, of course, you can add them, you can subtract them, you can multiply constants, et cetera, et cetera. And all these sorts of things, you need dot products and cross products, et cetera. vPython doesn't know any physics, but it knows a lot about vectors. And we're going to give it a specify a radius for this sphere. We're going to make it orange. We're going to specify that it leave a trail. As it leaves a trail, it will only add something to the trail every 30 times we update the position. We want accuracy in updating the position, but we don't want to spend a lot of time plotting more track when we don't need to. And we're going to retain the last 100 of those. Okay. And we'll make a, and having made the giant, we'll give it a mass, two times 10 to the 30th kilograms is in fact our own sun's mass. And we'll give it a momentum, giant dot P, which is a vector multiplied by the giant's mass. So there, we give the velocity and multiply by its mass and there's its initial momentum. Then we'll do the same thing with the dwarf. We make a second sphere. Um, it's a, a somewhat different location, a somewhat different radius. It's a different color. It also is going to leave a trail 
with the same interval and retaining. And its mass is half that of the other. And its momentum is the opposite of the other one, so that the total momentum is zero, so the center of mass is not moving. That's why it didn't drift. Okay. Having established that, and now we'll move down a little bit and show you all of this at once. We in line 14, and that is readable, isn't it? We specify a time interval of 10 to the fourth seconds. And we write a while loop. While true means iterate everything that's indented under this while statement infinite number of times. So this is a, a, a forever loop. We follow that by a rate statement that says, I don't care how fast your computer is, I'm not going to let you do more than a thousand iterations per second. So it's clamped. Okay. If, it, if you go too fast, you don't see anything. Okay? Then on line 17, we calculate a vector that points from the giant star to the dwarf star. And it is a vector. So we've sub done vector subtraction here. And then we're going to use the Newtonian calculation to get the, the force, which is take the giant, the, well, take the, the constant, multiply by the giant's mass times the dwarf's mass, r hat, hat of r, the unit vector, divided by the magnitude of that vector squared. So that gives us the gravitational force that one star exerts on the other. The impulse is of course that force times the delta t, and that impulse added to the current, in our case, the initial, giant's momentum is a new momentum, and we overwrite the momentum with the new one. So for those of you unfamiliar with, with the equal sign in programs, it doesn't mean mathematically equal. It doesn't mean that one is equal to two. It means it, uh, evaluate the right side of the equal sign and overwrite the thing on the left. So the effect of line 19 is to update the momentum of the giant star. Line 20 is very similar. It's just that by reciprocity, the force acts in the other direction. So we update its momentum. And then comes something that may be a little surprising. So we've updated the momentum. Now we want to update the momentum, the positions. And so we're going to take the current position of the giant and we're going to add to it a velocity times dt. Well, what velocity should we use? Should we use the old velocity at the beginning of this time of middle, the, the one at the end, or should we do arithmetic uh, average, which would seem to be the most natural thing to get the highest uh, accuracy. It turns out, and this is not obvious, this is Euler-Cromer first order integration, where for the average velocity, oddly enough, you use the new velocity, the velocity at the end of the time interval. It's not obvious that that should work. It works better than anything else when you're doing first order integration. And in the freshman course, we only teach first order integration. We don't need to do runga cut or anything. The computers are fast enough that we don't need to play tricks here. We can just do something very basic here. And so we'll update the, the giant's position from its momentum and we'll update the dwarf's position from what it was. Now, where exactly in this program? Well, first of all, the program is very short. Secondly, it looks like physics statements. It doesn't look like 3D graphic statements. In fact, where are the graphic statements? They're not there, are they? Well, okay, we did make two spheres. I guess that counts as graphic statements, but 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 excuse me, and, and leaving a trail and being able to look at it from different perspective with the mouse, and what's going on here? The rate statement has two functions, two things it's responsible for doing. The first thing is clamp, don't do more than a thousand while loop iterations per second, no matter how fast your supercomputer is. Maybe you have a quantum computer, 
but we'll only do a thousand for you. Secondly, it watches the clock. And if a 60th of a second has gone by since the last time we called upon the WebGL graphics library that is built into the modern browser, if more than a 60th of a second has gone by, we'll call on WebGL to paint a new picture. In fact, it erases the canvas, starts all over again, and draws a, a scene using the current attributes of those sphere objects whose positions have been recalculated and re-specified. And the net effect is that frame after frame, you're getting a different picture each time, about 60 times a second, okay? So it's really the case here that you get a navigable, by navigable, I mean that you can rotate and you can zoom and you can pan. You get a navigable 3D animation as a side effect of physics calculations. That makes it feasible to introduce serious an introduction to computational modeling in the intro course, which is a crowded course. Yeah, it is. But this actually makes many things very vivid. In particular, you get a very strong sense of mechanism here. If I give you a formula for ellipse and, and tell you, well, you, you plug in R or something, then that's one kind of thing. But here you actually see it step by step by step by step. We're just using a momentum principle to update it and update the position. Um, I'll quickly show you a couple further examples, uh, improvements in this program, and I won't go into them in great detail, but on lines 14 and 15, I'm going to attach an arrow to each of those stars and specifying with a scale factor, uh, a, a color that the momentum attribute of that should get up, uh, represented by an arrow. And so as it goes, you get these arrows. And I didn't have to change the loop. I just had to say, attach an arrow to the momentum attribute of those two stars, okay? And one more, uh, let's add some graphs. So here we specify a graph that's 200 pixels tall, and we define three curves for that graph to raise that kinetic energy, potential energy, and total energy. And when I run that program, and I better close down a little bit so you can see the whole thing, then you get a real-time graph. It, 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 we're not saving up data and then graphing it. The graph is live. It's, it's going with the 3D animation that you see. And, and what you're seeing here, of course, is that the addition of the two energy terms is flat, <laughs> okay? Um, and so that's, that's one kind of thing that you can do. Uh, there is another thing that you can do with these programs you can export those JavaScript programs, they're compiled to JavaScript, you could uh, export them and embed them in a document. This is the WordPress document in my blog at brucesherwood.net. And it's, uh, if you have a wheel running that's got charges on it, it's subject to the magnetic field of that current loop on the left, then you actually see that despite the fact that gravitational forces can't do work, they can influence the distribution of the energies. And so what you're seeing here is a trade-off between the translational kinetic energy, one half the total mass, the center of mass velocity squared, and the rotational kinetic energy. And the sum of them indeed is not changing. So there's no network being done, but, but okay. And this is just embedded in a WordPress document. And one other thing to show you is that while in the freshman course, it makes a lot of sense for the students to be using WebV Python because they don't have to know anything about file systems or, and it's all saved in the cloud for them. Um, but in an advanced course, you might want to use, say, a Jupyter Notebook. And so let's look at a Jupyter Notebook here that has...
that code <laughs> brought over from where we were. And if I run that program, put the cursor in the first cell. There we go. So here, here it is running with installed Python. And the advantage there, of course, is if you've installed Python, great effort perhaps, um, then you can import arbitrary Python modules. With WebE Python, you can't import the type, you can't import other Python modules because you're actually in JavaScript world. But that's completely adequate for the freshman course. Really? And while she's getting set up, perhaps I could take a question or a comment or I should give all this stuff to you, yes? Uh, no, I don't think. So can I yeah, you already share mm -hmm. um, The computer might go. Uh, 
but we have not fully understood how big a barrier it was about temperature to install high five and stuff. Thank you. Okay. All right. Can can you hear me? Okay. This needs to. I'm sorry. I didn't have a microphone at the time. So what I said uh, is irrelevant. Doesn't count. <laughs> I, I should say webvpython.org. There's almost two hundred thousand accounts there now. Many of them are more of them. They, they might have been students in a course that are no longer using it, perhaps, or they've graduated to install Python. Um, it only costs about $30 a month to run this. It's free to everybody. And the reason why it's so cheap is that all I have to do is send you the libraries, and you might even have them cached on your machine anyway. You don't even have to do that. All of the comp compiling to from Python to JavaScript is in your browser not in my server and all of um uh all of your execution of the program is in your browser not in my server so <laughs> so i want to take a few minutes to talk about at least one of the things that one can do with with uh, would be Python. And one of the one of the reasons we actually this was invented was because we wanted to introduce computational modeling in the intro calculus based physics course and we needed an appropriate tool. So I'm going to talk about uh, computational modeling in the intro course, show you some of what I actually mean, and then talk a little bit about research and assessment on what's actually happening. So the first question is why on earth would you want to do that? Um, so why would you put computation in the intro physics course? It's already a pretty full course. And the real, the real answer is to see physics in action, to, to uh, be able to, yeah, to create models of, oh, thank you. Um, of, of, complicated physical systems and use fundamental physics principles to model them. And then to be able to extend and refine the models. Um, it, in doing so, one gets a much different sense of mechanism than one does at just looking closed form solutions for something like constant acceleration or circular motion at constant speed or something like that. The second reason is that in computational models of this kind, one can not only um, make graphs and write algebraic statements, but you can actually see the behavior of the system at the same time. And so these representations of math, graphs, and system behavior can be coupled in a way that's actually fairly powerful. So that was the first, that was the main reason, but then a lot of other stuff came up along the way, um, we all do it. All scientists use computers now and engineers and biologists and it's authentic scientific practice. And it's, it should be part of what we all do as scientists, even if we're just beginning scientists. It means you can solve open-ended problems. Um, you can learn about what initial conditions mean, what parameters mean. You can explore the behavior of, of what looks like a simple system but may generate very complicated behavior if you actually have a model that you can experiment with. Um, it turns out one of the virtues is that in order to write these models, as you saw, you use, a sim you use symbols. It looks kind of like algebra, except you're often spelling out names of things. A lot of times in intro courses, what students are typically doing is just punching numbers into calculators and then writing sort of number soup on their papers. And this actually, uh, sort of enforces the discipline of actually formulating a problem symbolically and writing it out step by step. Uh, plus, you can do cool stuff. <laughs> so you can make you can actually physics homework can be creative, which is kind of a fun thing. Um, but how? So again, this isn't a computer science course. 
most intro students about in a typical intro physics course, maybe 25% of the students have ever written a program or it may be smaller than that. So we can't teach them <clears throat> programming starting from nothing without taking big swaths of physics out, right? Well, no, because in, and, and also it's really scary. And this is not just students who are scared, they're instructors who are scared too, because they haven't done this before, they haven't had experience. So what you wanna do is first of all, use a really inviting environment that actually has appropriate tools for the task. So it does graphics, it, um, it allows you to use vectors as vectors instead of doing all those horrible components. Um, teach just a little bit at a time in a physics context. So you're always solving interesting physics problems, but you're doing it computationally as well as analytically. Um, pick a very minimal set of com computational ideas that you need. So you saw, if you know, if you're an experienced programmer, you saw a lot of stuff that wasn't in those programs that Bruce was showing. Okay, there weren't any functions, we weren't doing recursion, we weren't doing fourth order longer cutter. Um, there, we didn't need it. Okay, there's a lot you don't actually need. Um, typically to get started, students, you want students to be able to work on computational tasks in groups uh, with a sort of knowledgeable person around to a TA or an instructor around to help out. Um, and you want it to be a part of the culture. So if, there's, if, if I'm lecturing and I'm gonna do a calculation, I'll typically just bring up vPython and do the calculation. If students do their homework in vPython, first of all, they get a free vector calculator. And second, their homework looks really organized. And another virtue of that is that when you get all through with this elaborate problem solution and you discover that you use the wrong number in the initial calculation, all you have to do is change that number and rerun your program. You don't have to sit down with your calculator. Okay, so there's a lot of reasons this is. Um, and the last thing is that uh, to the extent possible, having a curriculum that actually supports iterative calculations, teaches an iterative approach to these calculations is a big plus. Uh, <coughs> We're the authors of matter and interactions with which this is built into the text. So this is a fundamental approach hand in hand with the analytical, the traditional analytical approaches. Even if you don't use that text, it really is important to have significant support in the instruction for a new approach. So I wanna show you some examples of things students do. And I'm gonna start with the very first simplest thing and then um, some more complicated things. Okay. okay. So um, this is an environment called Trinket. Uh, Trinket is developed by a company called Trinket. And what it does is uh, it actually allows one to embed vPython or web vPython pieces in a sort of web-based tutorial. Um, so what Trinket lets you do is it so you can you can interact in the usual way but you can also on this web page modify it so suppose we make the color green and we run it okay so that's what trinket allows you to do so one of the first tasks in 
in that we do with students is a really simple task involving just constant velocity, which is one of the first things that comes up in an intro physics course. And so here's our problem. We have two spiders sitting on the end of a twig and they're both gonna go down web strands to the ground. And they're both, each is traveling at a constant velocity, but the velocities are a little bit different. Okay, so spider one has a velocity of zero minus 0 0.010 meters per second. And spider two has a velocity that's the same in the y direction, but it's also got a, an X component of 0 0.007 meters per second. And the questions are which spider gets to the ground first and how far apart are they when they get to the ground? <laughs> now, if you're an intro physics student, neither of these questions is necessarily entirely obvious. <laughs> and so what we do together is to write a program to, to solve this problem. And then the student's task is just to modify it to do certain other things. So, um, so there's a little video embedded here, which goes through writing this program, which I'm not gonna show you, but, and then the question, and uh, the final program we get is, let's see here. It looks like this. So here are two spiders. So there's a lot going on here. We've got, I don't know if you can actually see this. You can probably see it with the light colored one. The spiders are leaving trails, but the trails are actually points that are, that are laid down at equal time intervals. And, uh, and we're also printing out down here at each time step, the time, the position of each spider and whatnot. So it looked like they actually got to the ground at the same time. And let's see if that's true. Uh, looks like, yep, they both got to the ground at exactly the same time. Now, interestingly, the position was never zero. And that's just a feature of computation. If you're doing lots of repeated calculations with floating point numbers, you get some round off error because the, the representation of a floating point number inside the computer is not completely exact. Okay, it truncates at some point. And so you never quite get to zero. So you really have to test for close to zero in these things. Um, that's true in your calculator too. If you ever did, you know, 2 million calculations of of this kind in your calculator, you get, you get the same you get the same effect. So it looks like they hit the ground at the same time. And how far apart are they? Well, we see where their positions are. This one has an x position of two point one meters, and this one has an x position of minus 0.5 meters, and therefore they seem to be two point six meters apart. And that might have actually been a little tough to do analytically. So. Computation allows you to solve some problems that, <clears throat> that are not necessarily all that easy to solve off the bat analytically. <clears throat> In this context, um, students do plenty of other things. So there's a, uh, we have a, and I'll show you this program here. There's a, a falling package and a drone has to go up and catch it before it hits the ground so it doesn't smash on the ground. Um, and the question is, can the drone actually do it? Because the drone has uh, a fixed, it can exert a fixed, it has a fixed acceleration. The force that the air plus the earth it exerts on it is fixed, but it's got a top speed. So the question is, is the drone going to actually catch the package or not? And 
here we'll see the dark. We actually managed to give the drone, grab the motor up so the force was exactly right. So it caught the package, but it didn't start that way. Okay, so you need to, and there's some complicated stuff in this program. You have to figure out how you know if the drone caught the package. You know, what's your criterion for deciding that, that it's caught? So it stops there. Well, what we did here, there, there's more than one way to do this, but what we did here is actually um, so we looked at the distance between the center of the drone and the center of the package. So that we, get, we can get a vector, but we know the vector positions of those two things. We calculate the vector displacement. We take the magnitude of that and then just see if that's less than the sum of the radii. And if it is, then it's caught. So that, that there are plenty of other ways to do that. <clears throat> Further along, um, Harmonic oscillators are, of course, have analytic solutions. And you may or may not have studied that in your intro physics course. So mass on a spring oscillates. <clears throat> but what happens if you, uh, so, so let's start out our mass and spring. Uh, oscillating without friction. So we'll say the friction force is so zero vector. Now, here's the guts of the program. And what are we doing? You may never have thought of the spring force as a vector before, but you can calculate the spring force as a vector. And actually, um, that turns out to be a useful thing to do in many circumstances because you can actually do 3D oscillations. The same, it's the same program you'd use to calculate a 1D oscillation. So what we're doing is drawing a vector from the, the fixed end of the spring to the, the movable, movable end of the spring. From that, we can get the current length of the spring. That's just the magnitude of the vector. Um, and we get a direction, which is the unit vector there. And so then the force, no matter if you're at an angle or anything else, the, the spring force is then just minus the spring stiffness times the, the stretch of the spring, the difference between the current length and the relaxed length of the spring times that unit vector. So we calculate the spring force, and we add the friction force, which is currently zero. And we let the program run. <laughs> and here we're plotting the energy. So we're plotting uh, red is kinetic energy of the system, blue is spring potential energy, and magenta is the sum. And it looks it's constant because we're not losing any energy. Okay, what's going to happen though if we add friction? What's that graph going to look like? Okay, this is not a problem you can do with baby calculus easily. So let's add a kind of friction that's called viscous friction. Viscous friction um, depends on the speed of the block and it's opposite. So it's opposite to the velocity. So adding viscous friction allows us to see what happens. And that's a pretty interesting graph. You notice that that's not a, not a steady decline. So think about if you can explain why the graph looks the way it does. Okay, we are very close to time. I'd like to show you one more thing that 
that students um, do sort of at the end of the second semester. They can actually make a model model of a cyclotron. So let me let me explain a little bit about how a cyclotron works actually. Um, um, so the basic the basic idea behind a cyclotron is that well, what you want to do is you want to get a charged particle going really fast. And the charged particle is usually a proton. And so what you do is apply an electric force to that proton. So it goes really fast. Well, if you want to get it going really, 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 really fast, then you have to do this for kind of a long time. And so what Lawrence's brilliant idea was that you didn't have to do this in a line, you could actually make it go around in a circle. So if you apply a magnetic force, then your proton will go around in circles. And if you have two charged plates here with a potential difference between them, then you could get it, give it a kick every time it crossed the, that gap, the potential difference. Of course, you don't want to apply the electric force when it's, um, um, let's see if we have a, so the, the container for a cyclotron looks kind of like this. And this is a model of one of Lawrence's early cyclotrons. So there's these hollow metal D-shaped things. It's like a hollow metal cylinder that got caught in half and put plates on the end with little holes in them. Um, and Gauss's law tells us, of course, that inside these cylinders, the electric field is going to be zero. But if we put a potential difference here, then there can, there can be an electric field in the gap that gives it this proton a kick. And the key is, though, there's a problem because the proton comes around here. So suppose the electric field is to the left, to the right in here. Um, that's okay if the proton's going this way, but it's not so okay if the proton's going that way. So by the time it gets around there, you want the electric field to be going the other way. So you need a sinusoidally varying electric field. And it turns out, interestingly, that there's one particular frequency that if the proton doesn't get going too fast, um, you can just leave the frequency alone, despite the fact that the orbit of the proton is going to change and it'll work. So here is a model of a cyclotron that students actually can write at the end of the electricity and magnetism portion of the course. The, so this wireframe shows you where the Ds are. The cyan arrows are the, are the magnetic field, which is in this case in the plus y direction. The proton is this, this uh, little red dot here in the middle. And right now it's starting in the gap. The electric field is to the right. Those are the orange arrows. But the electric field is actually gonna um, change direction. And, whoops. So we see the, uh, interestingly, that the, we picked a frequency such that when the, the proton gets to the gap, the electric field is in the perfect direction to give it another kick. And then by the time it gets back to the gap, it's maximal that way. And so the kinetic energy of the proton looks like this as a function of time. It just gets a kick every time it gets to the gap. So what do you think would happen if we use a different frequency? Well, that's something you can experiment with in the program. This is completely within the capabilities of, of, of students to do at the end of a semester of EM. I drew the Ds. I didn't make them do that, but but the rest of it is. Um, so I'm basically out of time. Let me just say that there there has been various kinds of we've done various kinds of formative PER research about this. We've videotaped students in labs working on these these problems and analyzed it. We've 
run experiments. We've done assessments at the end of semesters to see if students could read and understand programs. And that all comes out, that, that's fed into improving these materials, but it's certainly a possible thing. As Bruce mentioned, of course, this is there's a pretty seamless transition to upper level computing and upper level courses where you can use the full power of Python by switching to Python installation and with the editor and the IDE of your choice and uh, or, or Jupyter Notebooks and have the full power of the Python ecology. So I will quit um, and see if you have any questions.